Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with our next session, which is the bariatric surgery Pecha Kuchas. My name is Laura Vergeer. I'm a PhD student in nutritional sciences at the University of Toronto and the special events coordinator for the Obesity Canada Student Executive, and I'll be chairing this session. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Pecha Kuchas, the format is 20 slides of 20 seconds each for a total of 6 minutes and 40 seconds. And I just want to check that the judges, they do have their evaluation sheets. Yeah, okay. So if you can just hand those in to me at the end of the session, that would be great. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, who is Rachel Morcom from Queen's University. Good morning, my name is Rachel Morcom. I'm an epidemiologist at Queen's University. Today I'll be presenting on a study that examined the gap between patients eligible for and those referred for bariatric surgery in southeastern Ontario. The principal investigators of the study were Dr. Boris Zevin, a bariatric surgeon at Kingston Health Sciences Centre, and Dr. David Barber, a family doctor and associate professor at Queen's University. Our research team was a multidisciplinary collaboration um, between family medicine, education, and surgery departments at Queen's, and also included the CEO of the Ontario Bariatric Network, Dr. Marin Mdari. The uh, project was funded by Medtronic, and we received ethics board approval from Queen's University. The study I'm telling you about today is part of a larger project that aimed to explore the barriers um, to access to weight management care for persons living with obesity. Um, the larger study obtained the perceptions and opinions from primary care providers and patients um, and helped inform the development of, of an education event that we held last November um, for primary care providers on obesity management. Obesity is a complex heterogenic disorder and achieving sustained and clinically relevant weight loss can be extremely difficult. Many people view bariatric surgery as an extreme measure to treat obesity. However, there is mounting evidence that this surgery can achieve significant results with individuals maintaining a loss of 20 to 30 percent of their weight. Ontario has identified access to bariatric surgery as a priority and established publicly funded and medical and surgical weight loss programs called Bariatric Centers of Excellence. A primary care provider refers patients to the centers through a centralized referral portal called the Ontario Bariatric Network. Eligibility for a patient to be referred to the OBN or medical, for medical or surgical weight loss is based on NIH criteria, so a BMI 40 or over, or a BMI 35 to 39 with an obesity-related comorbidity. The creation of the OBN in 2009 led to a 313% increase in the number of bariatric surgeries in Ontario. Though the effectiveness of bariatric surgery has been well established in the literature, there is still an underutilization of this intervention. A survey of family physicians in Ontario found that over 70% have referred no more than 5% of their eligible patients. In the U.S., less than 1% of individuals eligible undergo the procedure. The objectives of this study were to define the number of individuals with morbid obesity within a geographic region of one local health authority in Ontario, and to define the number of individuals who were referred for medical or surgical weight loss within this region, and lastly, to explore the patient factors that predict referral for medical or surgical weight loss. To achieve these objectives, we designed a retrospective observational study that used patient data from primary care medical records. Our patient population included any individual who lived within one region in southeastern Ontario that visited their primary care provider between 2012 and 2017 and met the NIH criteria for referral for bariatric surgery. The data came from the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network, pronounced SIPSIN, a national organization that extracts clinical care data from electronic medical records. Um, and we linked this de-identified primary care data to de-identified referral data provided by the OBN. The SIPSIN data and the OBN data were linked using deterministic linkage methodology, which paired patients using three common data elements, postal code, date of birth, and gender. Upon linkage, there were 950 unique record pairs. Of all the patients with records within the SIPSIN database, 16.2% were eligible for medical or surgical weight loss referral. The linkage with OBN determined that only a small proportion, 6.7% of those eligible for medical or surgical weight loss were referred to the OBN, 71.9% for surgery, 28.1% to the medical weight loss program. Multivariate logistic regression was conducted with referral as the primary outcome and demographic and clinical characteristics as independent variables. 
As expected, BMI was the strongest predictor with a significant dose response effect. Women, those with a BMI greater than 40, patients with diabetes or those living rurally were also significantly more likely to be referred to the OBN. This study successfully linked two de-identified databases using deterministic linkage. Showing that this linkage can be done creates more opportunities to use this type of data to evaluate the management of obesity in primary care. We determined that only 6.7% of patients who are eligible for referral have actually been referred by their primary care doctors. In our study, there were significantly more females referred than males, which is consistent with previous studies that show a distinct gender disparity. Over 75% of those who undergo bariatric surgery in Canada are female. The finding that those living rurally are more likely to be referred was unexpected, as previous research has shown that rural residents are actually less likely to actually undergo the surgery. Previous research has been predominantly self-report studies and shows a wide variation in referral rates. One study that interviewed primary care doctors in Ontario found that only 40% that only 40 of family doctors mentioned bariatric surgery as a weight loss option to their patients, most stating it as a last resort only considered by patient request. The low referral rate found in our study may be reflective of the negative beliefs that many patients have about the efficacy and safety of bariatric surgery. Survey studies have found that 57 to 77 percent of those eligible for referral are not receptive to, medical, to surgical weight loss because of fear of surgical complications, feeling of not needing the surgery to lose weight, and fear of dying. A provider's beliefs, education, and experiences also play a significant role in how often patients are referred. Many primary care providers have the perception that treating obesity is futile and may avoid uh, addressing weight issues or postpone much needed discussions to another day due to kind time constraints. And physicians have identified inadequate clinical training in obesity management as a barrier to the appropriate care. A limitation of this study was that the record, the record linkage was not manually validated. However, the probability of a mismatch was very low, less than 5%. Secondly, our study only determined if a patient was referred to the OBN and not if the patient actually underwent the procedure. For effective change, we need data. We hope to continue our collaboration with the Ontario Bariatric Network and validate our linkage methodology and quantify the referral rates in other parts of Ontario. This project is important in shedding some light on significant gaps in obesity management as the referral rates of eligible patients with morbid obesity is strikingly low. Thank you, Rachel. And I would just like to quickly remind you that although we're not taking questions during this session, all of the presenters will be at their posters afterwards if you'd like to ask them some questions. So our next speaker is Giada Ostinelli from l'Institut Universitaire de Cardiologie et Pneumologie de Québec. Okay, so I would like to thank the evaluating committee for choosing me for this challenging talk. Um, so <laughs> my name is Jada Stinelli, and today I'm going to present about the cortisol awakening response in patients with severe obesity awaiting bariatric surgery. Never done a pitcha before. <laughs> Okay, so the learning objective of my talk is to acknowledge the importance of correctly defining the cortisol awakening response as, or CA air, uh, as the existing definition cannot be used interchangeably. I will show you that this response is only weakly associated to some of the metabolic parameters. Glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, have been recognized as possible mediators in the pathophysiology of ab abdominal obesity. This is due to the resemblance between uh, Cushing syndrome and some features of uh, abdominal obesity. Cortisol secretion is under control of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. When under stress, the hypothalamus secretes CR CRH, which uh, stimulate the pituitary to release ACTH. This, in turn, regulates the secretion of cortisol by the adrenal gland. The activity of the HPA can be measured via the cortisol awakening response, which is thought to be blunted in obesity. The CAR is usually measured upon awakening using multiple salivary sampling. Data on <coughs> salivary cortisol can then be plotted into a graph. 
as you can see from the slide. According to the literature, there are a number of ways uh, that can be used to define and calculate the CAR. The first is to consider the total area under the curve. So here you see it in uh, orange. However, to highlight the dynamic cortisol increase that characterizes the cortisol awakening response, uh, CAR can also be defined as the incremental area under the curve. Here you see it colored in yellow. On the other hand, the third, the third method only considers the changes in salivary cortisol that happen between the first sample, so the one taken upon awakening, and the last one. In the framework of the study, the last sample was taken uh, 30 minutes after awakening. Finally, uh, the fourth method um, <coughs> defines the CIR as the difference between the mean um, measurements that are taken around the cortisol peak, so 15 and 30 minutes after awakening, and uh, the first sample. As you can imagine, um, <coughs> that are really difficult to compare when studies use different CAR definitions. This gives us the idea to compare the four definitions with the, variable, with the met metabolic variables that are used to uh, diagnose metabolic syndrome. Our cohort included 41 uh, bariatric pa patients with a BMI of 50 and where the majority, majority were females. When considering the CAR as a mean increase, we found a positive, although weak, uh, correlation with fasting triglyceride. A similar positive correlation was also found uh, with, between fasting triglyceride and the incremental area onto the curve of the cortisol awakening response. However, uh, we found no association between the total area under the curve or delta CAR and the diagnostic feature of the metabolic syndrome, such as waist, waist circumference, HDL, fasting glucose and triglyceride, or blood pressure. Similarly, there was no difference in any of the CAR measurement and the diagnosis of hypertension, diabetes, or metabolic syndrome according to the NCEP criteria. We then divided the incremental area under the curve into quartiles and compared the fourth quartile labeled as uh, high responders to the first. So in this case, was, they were labeled as uh, low responders. As you can see from this graph, high responders had higher waist circumference. In addition, uh, CAR are your CAR high responder, meaning bariatric patients with a higher incremental area under the curve, had also lower HDL cholesterol uh, plasma concentration. Finally, the fourth quartile, uh, finally, <laughs> fourth quartile of the incremental area under the curve had a higher fasting triglyceride. These three differences uh, between high and low responders point towards a possible association <coughs> between metabolic impairment and the CAR in severe obesity. As you can see, CAR definition behaves differently with delta CAR and the total area under the curve that were not associated to any of the variables studied. This may easily create confusion. I'm happy to see that I'm happy to say to you that luckily enough in 2016 consensus guidelines were published. Experts advise to report the to report the findings for the first sample, so the one taken up on awakening, and the CAR defined as in the incremental area under the curve or a mean increase. In conclusion, during my presentation, I show you that triglyceride were the only metabolic parameter that was consistently associated with CAR and that had high responded had higher at worse metabolic profile. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Giada. Our next speaker is Sarah Chapelsky from Edmonton Adult Bariatric Specialty Clinic and the University of, Al of Alberta. And the title of her presentation is Outcome of Bariatric Surgery in Patients Who Achieve Weight Loss in Excess of 20% with Liraglutide. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. So I have the very great privilege of working at the Edmonton Adult Bariatric Specialty Clinic, which is a provincially funded hospital-based clinic where we're able to offer both medical intervention as well as surgical intervention for the treatment of obesity. Now, as you know, probably know, bariatric surgery is the gold standard for the treatment of obesity. When a patient has bariatric surgery, the typical weight loss is 20 to 35% of their initial body weight. Now, patients will experience quite a rapid weight loss in the first few months after bariatric surgery, and then eventually weight stabilizes. Typically, we do see that weight loss plateaus somewhere between 12 and 18 months postoperatively. Thinking now about some of our medical interventions for weight loss, liraglutide is a medication that we uh, now use to treat obesity. In clinical trials, when liraglutide is combined with a lifestyle intervention, average weight loss is around 8%. Now, of course, this weight loss varies considerably from patient to patient. Some patients don't lose that much. But in our clinical trials, there are around 15% of patients actually have a weight loss in excess of 15%. When my colleagues and I started using liraglutide in practice, we actually noticed a cohort of patients that was doing exceptionally well, and that in fact lost more than 20% of their initial body weight with liraglutide, a weight loss that is in fact rivaling the outcomes that we see with bariatric surgery. Now, some of these patients still seek bariatric surgery. They may want to discontinue medications because of side effects or because of the cost of medications. And many people actually want bariatric surgery because they want to keep losing weight. This led my colleagues and I to ask the question, in this cohort of patients that have lost more than 20% of their initial body weight with liraglutide, what is the weight loss outcome after bariatric surgery? In our retrospective study, we looked at patients who were enrolled in our clinic over a 13-month period. Uh, patients uh, uh, underwent laparoscopic Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery or sleeve gastrectomy. And in our practice, all patients stopped liraglutide at the time of bariatric surgery. In our study, uh, we identified seven patients for entry. They all happen to be female. Quite a broad age range was represented. Patients were between the ages of 25 and 63 years. The majority of patients had a starting BMI in the 40s, though there were a couple outliers that had a much higher starting BMI. So let's take a look at the weight loss outcomes. I'm gonna show you the change in weight of each individual patient over time. First, we're gonna take a look at the weight loss outcome when patients are on liraglutide in advance of bariatric surgery. What you're gonna see is that patients spend quite a long time in our clinic before they have bariatric surgery. So all patients in this study were on liraglutide for somewhere between one and two years before they had uh, surgery. Again, the weight loss outcome, very impressive uh, in this group of patients. Median weight loss was 27.7% with a range between 22.7 and 32.7%. Next up, we are gonna take a look at the weight change after bariatric surgery. I'm gonna remind you again, we stopped liraglutide at the time of bariatric surgery, and what we were looking to see is what is the weight change now after bariatric surgery. As you can see, the majority of patients continued to lose weight after bariatric surgery. But their post-operative weight loss plateau happened much earlier than we see in other patients. More than half of our patients experienced that weight loss plateau within three months post-operatively. The vast majority had a weight loss plateau by six months, and all of the patients enrolled in our, our study um, hit that weight loss plateau by one year. Not surprisingly, if that 
post-operative weight loss plateau happens quite early, these patients aren't actually losing as much weight after surgery. So when we just look at post-operative weight loss, uh, median weight loss was 13.8% in this group, though there was quite a big range between 2.3% and 31%. Now, of course, if we're only looking at post-operative weight loss, this is telling just part of the story. And what we're really interested in is what is the overall weight loss outcome in this patient group? Again, very exceptional weight loss. So median weight loss, 38.1%, with a range between 27.9% and 49.9%. I want to also show you the change in BMI in this patient group over time. So first, we are going to just focus on patients who had that starting BMI within the 40s. And what you can see is when we look at their post-operative nadir, two of these patients actually achieved a BMI under 25, and the rest of patients achieved a BMI around 30. So again, a great result. So in conclusion, patients that lose more than 20% of their initial body weight with liraglutide and then go on to have bariatric surgery experience above average weight loss overall. Now when I'm seeing these patients in clinic and counseling them about what they can expect after bariatric surgery, I tell them that I expect them to keep losing weight after bariatric surgery, though they may not lose as much as patients who didn't have the same preoperative weight loss of they have, uh, as they have had. And of course, I tell them that I don't think they're going to continue to lose weight beyond six months to a year. Um, this work uh, was uh, made possible uh, by a number of doctors in our clinic, and so I just wanted to thank Drs. Kazi, Modi, Rai, and Sharma for also contributing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. And our final speaker of today's session is Jennifer Donnan from Memorial University of Newfoundland. And she'll be speaking about patient perceptions on characteristics for guiding prioritization of individuals with obesity for bariatric surgery. Thanks. Yes, my name is Jennifer Donnan and I'm from Memorial University. And I'm really excited to speak to you today, really on behalf of patients across the country living with obesity, about access to and prioritization for bariatric surgery. This is a patient-identified issue that they feel is problematic within the Canadian healthcare system and in need of our attention. So we all know that obesity is a growing problem in Canada, affecting over a quarter of the adult population. And severe obesity is actually the most uh, fastest growing subgroup. And though diet and lifestyle modifications uh, do um, lower weight, it's actually bariatric surgery that's the most effective. In terms of access to bariatric surgery, it's, the, um, it's actually on a first come, first serve basis with uh, patients, uh, once patients meet a basic eligibility criteria. So if they have a BMI of greater than 40, or greater than 30 with a comorbidity. And in Canada, as we can expect, demand far exceeds supply, and only 1% have access to care. So this leads to really long wait times, an increase in patient stress, a delay in further improvement in obesity-related conditions like hypertension and diabetes, and a further impairment in quality of life. And so patients with complex medical needs may actually suffer irreversible morbidity and even die while they wait. Um, the bariatric surgery team at Memorial has been hearing time and time again that wait times are just too long and that um, there's actually patients that with certain characteristics might require quicker access to care. And so the objective of this study was to identify patients' perspectives on factors they believe should inform prioritization for access to bariatric surgery. So to do this, we used a four-step uh, focus group approach called a nominal group technique. So step one was to generate ideas about uh, factors that should influence prioritization. Then we recorded those ideas. Then we engaged in an open discussion um, and shared and learned from one another. And then we ranked those ideas from most to least important. We recruited patients from within the bariatric surgery uh, program at Eastern Health through invitations uh, through their surgeons. And we also partnered with a patient facilitated and founded support group uh, for individuals pre and post surgery through their Facebook page. We had a tremendous response from our patient community, highlighting their recognition for the problem and their passion for supporting a solution. 
Finally, we uh, recruited 29 uh, participants in one of three focus groups. Uh, they were fairly representative of the broader bariatric surgery patient population with an average age of 46, mostly female, and about two-thirds that already had surgery. So I'll quickly walk through the themes that emerged. So theme one, the whole patient. Um, you know, this was a pretty dominant theme that we need to look holistically at patients and not look at any one particular characteristic that they might um, have. So this includes physical uh, and mental health comorbidities and impact on daily life. Theme two, mental health. So this was really dominant as there are many facets to how mental health impacts um, obesity and bariatric surgery. And so when we had this discussion, there was really two main elements that were important for when it comes to prioritization. And the first was the obesity-related anxiety and depression um, that comes with uh, obesity. And the second was uh, mental fitness for surgery, this idea that, you know, it really takes a commitment and a lot of motivation and a willingness to experience a real emotional roller coaster uh, once you proceed through bariatric surgery. And so access to more psychological care could help alleviate this. Theme four, uh, physical comorbidities. So we took a lot of time discussing individual comorbidities, but it was really clear that you can't look at anything in isolation and that it's the compounding effect that additional comorbidities have on overall health. That said, um, patients tended to naturally group co like comorbidities into several categories. So from most to least important, these included those conditions linked to cardiovascular disease, uh, those where weight impacts access to other healthcare services like orthopedic surgery, fertility treatments. Uh, three conditions where weight loss could alleviate symptoms, and then four, those conditions really not impacted by health. Theme five, body mass index. Well, this is already a criteria for surgery, and our participants certainly agree that it should still remain an important aspect. However, they highlighted that having a threshold of BMI actually encouraged patients to um, stop lifestyle modifications, and this is really counterproductive to what we expect and encourage of our population. Theme six, daily life. Patients really lamented on the fact that their excess weight impacted how they engaged with their children, how they maintained employment, how they uh, participated in hobbies, or even used stand-up showers, and this just perpetuated the mental health and low self-esteem that they experienced. Theme seven, irrelevant factors. It was really clear from our patient population that there are some characteristics that should not influence prioritization. And these included gender, uh, income, family history, and age. And I'll, while this really um, demonstrates how our population uh, highly value the principles of a publicly funded healthcare system, um, it also shows that they're dissatisfied with age restrictions. So we asked patients to rank uh, those characteristics from most to least important. What they found was most important was the number of health conditions someone had, body mass index, mental health, and then quality of life or daily activities. So we experienced an incredible passion from this patient population. They recognize the complexities and struggles patients face before and after surgery, and they've experienced and witnessed um, patients the consequences they suffer from long wait times, and they're asking for an equitable prioritization process that puts their needs at this center. So in conclusion, everyone that we talked to agreed that we can't just look at a threshold of BMI for access to bariatric surgery. We need to look at the whole patient. We need to look at their physical and mental health conditions that they're also experiencing and the impact that their condition has on their daily life. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our study team, which was led by Dr. Lori Twells. And I'd specifically like to highlight our patient partner, Jennifer Dion, for her incredible enthusiasm and, um, and support throughout the project. And this project was funded by our patient-oriented research uh, team, NL Support in Newfoundland. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. That was a really great session. And I'd just like to remind you that if you do have any questions for them, um, you're more than welcome to go see them at their posters after this. And if I could just get the evaluation sheets from the judges, that would be great. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.